And then we'll move on to our last speaker, Professor Liberato Ferrara from the Polytechnical University of Milano, who is also the project coordinator of the H2020 project Resilience. And this is also what I think he will be mostly presenting uh, today, as well as some uh, updates on the cost action Sarcos. So, uh, Liberato, the floor is yours. We can already see uh, your presentation, but not okay. yet. Uh, yeah, now it is shared perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, team, and good afternoon, everybody. As you said, uh, I am mostly presenting some of the latest developments and latest results of the Horizon 2020 project Resilience, which I am coordinator, coordinating and uh, of which also Maria Cruz spoke uh, about and some uh, you know, updates also on uh, cost action circus uh, with which we are doing some related work together. So just to start, I went back to, oh, sorry, which was the, the call of the uh, Horizon 2020 program in which resilience was funded and highlighted some of the key uh, words and key sentences. Durability is a key criterion for construction materials, as we have heard several times this afternoon. It's also likely the main reason for which we want the materials to self fill. And actually, we may have several applications in which durability becomes the governing criterion for design. Uh, including buildings and infrastructures in extremely aggressive conditions such as offshores. Obviously, if we announce the durability, we will likely expect reduced overall lifetime costs. But if we are uh, quite smart, I would say, in engineering our materials for announced durability, we can also try to achieve some uh, better, uh, you know, optimized costs in the production phase, uh, in the installation phase, and also have our materials better fit for a reuse and recycling since their concept and production. Well, as a matter of fact, we do have now fantastic advanced materials, cement-based materials in the concrete technology and in concrete construction industry, but their durability in real conditions sometimes is not very well understood. Also considering that in design codes now, durability is based on deemed to satisfy criteria, minimum criterion, and most of the advanced materials are intrinsically satisfying this deemed to satisfy rules. And so there is also not the exact way to promote the these materials and to take into account to exploit their benefits in the design. Another document I made reference with is this paper which was published in September uh, at the end of the first wave of the pandemics, uh, still by the European Commission and other related institutions, in which was addressed the role of materials in the post-COVID society. You can see some of the needs we need to create a less dependent, more dependent, more resilient economy and society. And we can do this by guaranteeing raw material supplies, ensuring higher materials durability, once again, higher energy efficiency, degree of material recycling and reuse, and material saving through optimized products, which can be designed with enhanced repair facilities. Well, so thinking of us as civil engineers and the role that we can play in the society, there are some main topics in which we need to focus. For example, let's start from the right and go to the left. Transportation infrastructures, we do know how important, we now realize how important they are in our daily life. And also when we experience, for example, delays and disruption just in traffic, uh, well, they cost every year about 3,600 US dollars to each household, so it's quite a sum. But also we have to face the effect of climate changes, uh, more extreme events. These pictures are from a couple of years ago, uh, a thunderstorm in the island of Malta in springtime, where several of us will flock there to enjoy some good time and sun, sun early sunshine uh, compared to our climates. And it is expected that, for example, in the coastal protection, we need to take actions because 
uh, we expect uh, under moderate mitigation scenarios or higher emission scenarios, some uh, significant rise in the sea level and about 700,000 European Union citizens are exposed to the risk of coastal flood. And as Nello reminded us at the beginning of our presentation, now the focus of the European Commission is going through carbon neutral society and the use of renewable energy sources is fundamental in this, for example, uh, offshore eolic energy, but also geothermal. Uh, if we go for more efficient infrastructure in geothermal plants, we can economically viable exploit resources that now cannot be exploited. But also the blue growth think that our planet is made by 70% of water, but really a very, very short share, very, very small share of our economy comes from the sea. So developing the blue economy, the revenues are expected to double in the next years, means exploiting marine living resources, improving the transport by sea, promoting the tourism, energy sources, but also going into defense and education. So this is the framework in which uh, as a consortium of 14 partners plus three linked third parties from eight European countries, we gather it together and we apply it for the Horizon 2020 funding with a project which focused on coastal defense and renewable energy infrastructures. And we aim it to answer this, this goal, this challenge by enhanced durability, high performance fiber reinforced cementitious materials. So our goal was develop the ultra high durability concrete concept, but also methodology for durability modeling and durability based design to predict the service life of structure under extremely aggressive exposures. The project uh, has started on January 1st, 2018, and we are now in its last year because we are concluding it at the end of March, 2022. And as partners, we are six uh, universities and research center. You can see there in the center, but the industrial partners, which are the majority of the consortium, they really span throughout the whole value chain of concrete construction industry. We go from producers of constituents for advanced cement-based materials to engineering consultancy companies, to precast producers, to infrastructure project and construction and large end user companies. And our approach, our strategy is to work through a three level innovation. So we start from product innovation. Actually, this was the first lab casting that we did. And we have also been modeling uh, the fracture behavior of these ultra high salmon based materials. These are some unpublished work well, is going to present soon in uh, the Biobajan conference in May. Uh, Antonio Cibelli, our PhD student, and actually is going to work on modeling of both the mechanical and the durability. You can see on the right hand side, the three point bending test, and is also modeling how the healing is proceeding. And thinking of uh, extremely aggressive exposure, well, we know how chlorides, oh, sorry, how chlorides are aggressive to concrete, but this picture I took in a geothermal power plant, this is a cooling, water tower and these rains is a water containing chlorides and sulfates. This rain lasts 364 days per year. So only one day per year, the tower is shut for maintenance, the basin is cleaned and the, the, the process restarts. So you can think of how aggressive this water, both chemically and mechanically can be for the structure. And these are some pictures I put here, a uh, structural application based approach, because in the project, I will speak about this a little later also, we developed it, we built, and we are currently monitoring six pilots. One of these is a pilot mimicking some uh, structural concept for the cooling water tower. Uh, you can see actually it consists of three cells. Each one is about uh, 50 square meters in plan. And on the left hand side, you can see a helid crack. These are pictures I took 10 days ago when we went for our uh, pilot survey uh, trips to the uh, structure, which is in Tuscany. One of the other pilot is this uh, uh, reservoir, suspended reservoir in the harbor of Valletta in Malta. It was built by the British in the 30s, so before the Second World War was severely damaged. And with the project, we completely retrofitted it. Actually, the picture is before the retrofitting, as you can see. 
And you can see also a, a photo of one of the cracks in the material, the shrinkage crack, which was completely healed. This simply because of the humid uh, climate that you have in Malta being close to the sea. So focusing on the three level uh, strategy that we are going to perform, we have performed in resilience. We started with material innovation. We introduced this acronym UHDC, ultra high durability concrete. Well, actually we mean by it a strain hardening fiber reinforced or textile reinforced cementitious materials, which has micro and nanoscale constituents, which are especially added to stimulate the self feeling and to enhance the durability in the cracked state. So in the uh, case study that I will uh, show the results about, we use that short steel fibers. We use that crystalline and mixture as stimulator of the self feeling. And we also use it in some cases, alumina nanofibers and cellulose nanocrystals, last especially added to stimulate the self curing of these materials, which experience a high autogenous shrinkage. And so we may need the reduction of this. Well, actually, this is the mixed design. You can see that there is quite a high content of uh, cement. We use that slag also to uh, enhance the uh, resistance to sulfate-rich waters. 1.5 by volume, 1.5% by volume of steel fibers. And our crystalline mixture was dosed at 0.5% uh, by weight of cement. And we use it in the, the other dosages that you can see here, the nano constituents. Obviously, we characterize uh, what did we want from these materials? Well, we wanted superior mechanical performance, which means a strain hardening behavior, because we were thinking of using it in many applications without any conventional reinforcement. We characterize that mechanical behavior by means of four-point bending test, but also by means of an indirect test methodology that we developed here in our lab. We call it double-edge wedge splitting test, which we demonstrated is able to straightforward provide the tensile crack stress crack opening relationship. So we verified the strain hardening capacity up to a strain level, 0.5%, which was suitable for our application. We used the low that we obtained from the double-edge wedge splitting test as an input to simulate the flexural test and we obtained a good prediction for, for deep beams in which we stayed on the upper bound of the experiments and 14 beams where we stayed on the lower bound. This is because of the different fiber orientation that you have in deep uh, uh, structures and in thin structures. And then we went for a multi-parameter characterization of the self feeling. We wanted, uh, and this is one of the aspects that also Eric highlighted in his presentation, we wanted our material to maintain its strain hardening capacity over time. So we underwent to a series of cracking, immersion, and recracking and reimmersion to stimulate the healing of the flexural test specimens, both in a climate chamber, but also in a geothermal water that we went to pick up. Uh, to the uh, geothermal power plant. And also we use a uh, disc specimen, cylinder discs, that we pre-cracked in splitting and we use it to check the recovery in permeability. And also we are doing some work on chloride penetration. Uh, I put also the links to the uh, publications where the main results that I'm showing are published. Well, the self feeling, the first uh, aspect that we wanted to characterize was the sealing of the crack. So how much the crack did close. So we use uh, the microscope imaging of the crack and the post-processing uh, of the images that we acquired. Well, actually we compared the uh, concrete without the crystalline and mixture of the concrete with. And if you look at the gross results, this is also a thing in how do we have to look at our results? How do we have to manage that? If you just look at the index of cross sealing, you can see, okay, there is not much difference. But if you correlate the amount of crack sealing with the initial opening of the crack, you can see that these are the results without the admixture. Whereas if you go with the admixture, you can see that you can have a better healing with a larger opening of the crack. So this is the role of the crystalline admixture stimulating on the healing of these materials, which having a lot of cement, a lot of slag, and the low water binder ratio do inherently possess already a high autogenous sealing potential, but becomes even better with the stimulator. 
And the role of the nano additions, you can see clearly here in the left graph where the dot data points related to the mix with the nano alumina are the blue ones, which means that the nano alumina were effective in controlling the width of the crack. They were really around 10 microns each. Obviously in strain hardening material, you have multiple tiny cracks and you also have the better healing. And if you look also at the uh, recovery of durability versus crack sealing, the, uh, on the right graph, the dot data points referring to the mix with crystalline mixture and nano uh, alumina or nanocellulose are the blue, the red and the green, which are always on the top part of the graph. Well, obviously we also wanted to check that the material kept its mechanical properties. So you can see there an example of a, a stress crack opening curve upon the successive cycles of cracking and healing, cracking and healing. And we calculated the index of damage recovery or of stiffness recovery, if you like. And you can see that if in the long term, uh, the performance is quite similar. If you add the stimulator, you can have a faster healing in the short, in the short term. Uh, actually, you can see here between 90 days and one year, that is when all Europe experienced the severe lockout. So our specimen were able to heal for a longer time. And the same happened for permeability. Also in this case, going back also to the presentation of Marta, we had a water head of half a meter. If you measure the permeability, you can see similar recovery, but you can see on the small graph in the center that the mixture with the stimulated healing always guaranteed a better healing in the short and in the long term. Just a few results on the chlorides. This is a work in progress. Obviously, we developed the methodology with reference to regular concrete based on the silver nitrate test and on the titration to calculate the chloride depth profile and estimate uh, an apparent diffusion coefficient, even if in cracked conditions this may uh, question it about the significance, but anyway, you can see in the graph on top right how the uh, healing induced by the crystalline can delay the penetration of chlorides. Obviously, when you go with a material like the one we have been working with, which contains a lot of fibers, 120 kilos per cubic meters, actually the silver nitrate test is very difficult to be performed and the data to be interpreted. So. We developed quite a dedicated, a tailored test. So we had a, a split uh, disc and we uh, kept it under a chloride solution. But at the end of scheduled times, we underwent with a drilling. We drilled 12 small amount of materials. You can see three cores at four different depths and also at three different position with respect to the Crack. So just to have an estimate of the chloride penetration profile, both parallel to the crack and orthogonal to it. And this goes back to the question that Tim and Maria Cruz were discussing. What is the most important parameter, the crack width of the crack depth? Most likely they are both important because the, the penetration of the chlorides or the diffusion of the chlorides looks like to be a 2D process and we have to take them into account both. But as said, these are results that we are currently processing. And then we decided to go a little wider, to think a little wider, because there was this cost action which started uh, in September 2016, Sarcos, gathering 28 member countries plus two near neighbor countries and one international partner country. It was quite a productive cost action. We published four state-of-the-art review papers on the technologies for healing and external repairs, on the experimental characterization of self-healing and on numerical modeling of self-healing. And then we decided to uh, challenge ourselves in the uh, round robin or interlaboratory test, uh, six different technologies, actually two of them uh, have already published their results. In these interlaboratory tests, 30 laboratories for, from 18 countries are participating. And so we are replicating exactly the same self-healing methodology whose results I have shown before in RRT4 in nine laboratories and we are starting gathering the results together. So you can see here the labs coordinating this work, uh, Thessaloniki, Cambridge, Valencia, Politecnico di Milano, Ghent University and TU Delft. And here's some pictures and also thank to Marta and Elsan and Estefania and Francesco who coordinated two of these interlaboratory tests. What does it mean 
to produce in one's lab, in one laboratory, the specimens for all the labs. What does it mean to organize the shipping? But we successfully do it, and now the labs have completed, as I said, or are working to complete. So this is on the side of the material, but when we go to the process, the first thing that we have to ask ourselves, we are engineers, we design the structure. So how can we take into account the benefits of a self-filling material into design? So the issue is that we are working on a durability assessment based design process in which we explicitly couple together the durability models, the degradation models, for example, into the structural design algorithms. And we predict the evolution of a structural design parameter. For example, here is the flexural strength of a cross section in a concrete structure versus time as affected by degradation and healing together. So this can lead us uh, on one hand to overcome the time zero concept and also the cost per cubic meter concept, which sometimes affects our evaluation on the real benefits of self-filling materials. Obviously, you can pay more now for a better performing material, but this means that also your repairing will be delayed. And so the life cycle cost, even in a short time, could really become the opposite. So your uh, higher performance material, which costs more now, will become soon more competitive with respect to another solution, which may be more cheap now. And this also helps us in quantifying the end of life in order to have a, a, a more clearly defined time span to which refer, for example, our life cycle analysis, our life cycle cost estimates. But with respect to end of service life, is this truly an end, uh, citing a, a song, uh, by when I was young, or we can design our material to be fully recyclable. These are some work that we also did in Resilience Project. University of Valencia did some work. You can see there some of their, uh, you know, uh, debris from the specimens in the lab, which were brought to a recycling plant and were used to produce a new material. And we also did similar work was coordinated by the University of Malta and we also participated and the results that are shown in the bottom graph are related to this uh, experimental campaign. We re-employed the same material that we used for our lab tests to produce new material with similar composition, just replacing natural aggregates with our crushed material. The yellow bars are the reference concrete, the green and the red Respectively, we replace at 50 and 100% of the, the natural sand with our recycled material. And the blue uh, bars, we replace at 50% of the sand with carbonated, accelerated carbonated material. And we check at the mechanical performance, the durability, but also this is a picture with Niranjan Prabhu, which is a PhD student in the framework of Smartings, is obtaining in his research, he's doing now obviously some publishing. This is the self-filling capacity of the material with 50% recycled uh, UHPC inside. And you can see how it's, it's good. And we just got a preliminary acceptance of the paper in which we uh, assessed the resistance, the strength, performance, and the durability of this material. So, as I said, in Resilience Project, we have employed these and other similar materials in six full-scale uh, structures. You can see a, a pontoon in the Bay of Galway made by our partner Banagher precast concrete, a muscle raft made of precast pre-stressed girders in the harbor of Valencia made our partner RDC, the floating of a wind tower, uh, Rover Grupo installed the mock-up in the port of Sagunto, then we have two basins in geothermal power plant in Tuscany owned by NL Green Power and the retrofitting of the water tower in Malta, as you can see there. Well, these are some pictures. This is the construction of the uh, pilot for water, um, geothermal water. You can see we cast the fiber reinforced material in real scale. But you can also see in these three pictures the benefits. We moved from 10 centimeters thick ordinary concrete solution to six and even three centimeters thick precast slab solution. And the images on the right are a, a, a test uh, survey that we uh, made uh, 10 days ago 
with my PhD students there. Also, considering the benefits, economical and environmental, actually the project was uh, scouted to provide a contribution to the uh, European Green Deal Initiative. And this is a preliminary life cycle assessment that with our partner stress, we perform it with reference to the pilot, to the water pilot in the geothermal power plant. And you can see the improvements ranging from 11 to about 70% of the different indicators uh, for climate impact, environmental impacts of these structures. And we published it in the third Ryle MLCA symposium last year. So what's next? I'm just going to the very last slides. Well, first of all, we need an efficient way to manage all the data that the self-healing research is going to produce. And this is a, a work that I've been doing with a student on using artificial neural network to produce, for example, some design cards in which we relate the crack width and the period of healing to the uh, index of healing effectiveness. Or we also want to investigate how the self-healing affects the time evolution of the constitutive behavior of the material when the healing occurs under sustained loading. And we devised with my PhD student Salama Lobaidi these experimental setups that are now going to be installed in our basements here in Politecnico. And finally, incorporate the cracking evolution into service live prediction updating and upgrading our durability assessment based design methodology, including ultimate and serviceability limit states. So uh, this is our website, www.uhdc.eu, where you can also find the free MOOC and the newsletter that we regularly publish it. My contacts are there. I want to thank uh, all my uh, the colleagues that have been collaborating with me in resilience, my PhD students, some of them are picking up the results of resilience to work on them in their PhD thesis in the framework of Martin and uh, master students whose thesis were developed in the framework of resilience project and are also being developed now. And also I want to thank you for your attention on behalf of the World Resilience Consortium. These are the pictures, some very nice memories that we have of our previous meetings until the last one that we held in Valencia in February last year. You can see here on the top in the center, we visited the RDC pilot in the Valencia Harbor. And I want to thank you also on behalf of my research group here at Politecnico di Milano. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Liberato, for your very interesting uh, talk. Uh, one one uh, image that stood out to me was um, when you were showing the, the decrease of the performance over time. And there you showed that it's clearly beneficial to go for UHDC uh, instead of UHPC. Could you maybe briefly summarize for us what, what the difference is between these two different types of concrete? Well, actually in our, in our concept, UHDC is a, a, an evolution or an upgrading, I would say, of UHPC. As a matter of fact, UHPC, besides the strength, we know that it has excellent durability, but most of the cases it's claimed because of the very compact, very uh, compact microstructure, very compact matrix, very low porosity. But actually, we wanted to include in our durability assessment also what happens in the cracked state. So in our case, we mean that UHDC is a UHPC, which also has demonstrated higher durability in the cracked state and in real service conditions like the one that we are experiencing in, uh, in the activities of our project. And some of the results were also the ones that Maria Cruz showed for uh, the part that CSIC and UPV are doing in the project as well. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, then I would like to give the word to the Smartings Network Coordinator, Professor Neri Zabeli, uh, to give some final closing remarks on this workshop. Yes, uh, good afternoon again, everyone. I'm very happy that we had this uh, very interesting workshop. I hope you all enjoyed it. I 
specifically want to thank all the presenters, uh, the ones that have given the keynote lectures and that have shared the results from other projects with us, but also, of course, our own SmartThings PSRs, our PhD students that have made very nice presentations to give an overview of the initial results that they have obtained within the SmartThings project. And actually, I do not only want to thank the two PhD students per work package who have made the presentation, but also all the other PhD students who have contributed to the preparation of the presentations. And of course, I want to thank all of you, the audience, for joining us, for listening, and for actively asking questions in the chat. If any other questions would come up later, of course, feel free to contact us on the SmartThings email address. And please do not forget, if you are interested in our activities, to register for our newsletter, then you will be kept um, informed on all our future workshops, conferences, and articles as well. So then I think I can close the workshop and wish you all a very nice evening, or maybe in another part of the world it's not evening, but still then have a nice uh, day. See you later, hopefully in another week.